Great. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about brand storytelling and how digital has impacted the way the advertising industry works and what work uh, stands out and works well and what gets ignored. Um, I need a, I need my there it is. Let's see if this works. So first off, um, uh, as I was introduced, um, I'm a group creative director um, at Deutsch, which is an integrated advertising agency uh, in the U.S. And what that means is we work across all channels. My background personally is largely in digital, but I, um, because of the sort of convergence of media, I work on everything from television to digital to print. Yes, we're still doing some print. Um, and I work in this building, which was, uh, is now the Google building in New York. Um, it was originally the Port Authority building, but Google bought it for uh, $2 billion in cash a few years ago. Uh, because they can do that. Um, that's where we're located in Chelsea in Manhattan. Um, and the two guys on the right are um, my children who really wanted to come to Bulgaria. Uh, so here they are. That's the best I could do. Um, at the bottom are just some of our current clients. Um, PNC Bank, one of the largest banks in the US. Jägermeister, which pretty much everyone in the world knows. Uh, and uh, as uh, a few people know, Microsoft. Um, Outback Steakhouse, um, Lunesta, and Pricewaterhouse. So what, um, what are brand stories? Um, I'm going to talk about what they are, or what I think they are. It's debatable. Um, I'm going to talk about why they're important and why even a, even a startup um, should be thinking about what their story is um, and how they'll tell it. Uh, and I'll talk about how we create brand stories and how that's kind of changed uh, throughout the, the past you know, 15, 20 years. Um, but to start, let's talk about what a brand is. Um, because a company and a brand are not the same things, um, especially early on because you have a company doesn't necessarily mean, mean you have a brand um, solidified. Um, and also your product isn't necessarily a brand. Your product has features and you have a story about um, your product and what differentiates it in the market and what it does, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have a brand. And finally, the, the story of how you were created and who started you um, while relevant and you know to certain audiences, again, doesn't mean you um, you have uh, an established brand. Um, in in the work we do, we think of brands as stories and stories that you tell your audiences and and ideally stories that your audiences care about. Um, and they aren't they are they they should relate to what your company is about and what your product is about, but uh, they should ideally rise above that and. Uh, relate to the values of your consumer or your audience. Um, but more and more these days, uh, it's less in my mind about brand storytelling and more about story creation. That uh, the way the dynamics of digital media work and the way products get started and, and brands get spread um, is much more of a sort of co-creation with your audience um, rather than you just broadcasting out. Um, you know, this is very familiar to you all, I think, but the way things used to work in, in the world and in advertising uh, and marketing is that brands would communicate out their message through advertising and, and traditional messages, television, radio, et cetera. More and more these days, it's a lot more complicated. Brands talk to audiences, but audiences are much more enabled to talk to each other. And the fun part is audiences are now talking back to brands, um, and sometimes in a very encouraging, positive way, and often in a negative way. And it's a powerful feedback loop, that, and the strongest brands really embrace this. Um, so just quickly, why is it important for a brand and even a startup to create and spread these stories? Uh, and I think we've heard some, you know, we were just hearing about copycats. I think this is happening you know, it happens in every industry, but it's happening even faster and faster these days with, uh, with, with uh, digital startups. Here's four uh, streaming music services that are currently competing um, uh, in, uh, worldwide for the, the share of the market. Um, uh, Pandora, Spotify, RDO, um, and Beats Music. Um, and in my mind, none of, the, none of them are really telling a story. They, they have a product. The products do very much the same thing. Some music's available on one and not the other. They have similar price points. The strongest brand will be the one, I believe, the, that first tells a really compelling story um, and creates that, actually co-creates that with their audience. Um, because a brand story tells people what you stand for as a brand, what your values are, 
and why you're relevant to their lives. It gives people, this is super important, it gives people a reason and a way to talk about you. It actually gives them a language um, to, to share with their friends about why they should consider um, using you. And in the end, it inoculates you or protects you from uh, competitors um, who have similar offerings. So I'm just going to start with a few examples. These first few examples are not work I've done. They're work that I admire. Um, you know, some of this might be very familiar to you. Um, maybe not. Um, but the first one is Dove Real Beauty Sketches. Um, Dove is a soap. Um, and not too many people are interested in a detailed, you know, long story about a soap. So Dove's brand, has, uh, uh, Dove's brand is about what they call real beauty and a, and a sort of questioning and ongoing um, uh, reimagination of what beauty means today and, and really a conversation around beauty. Um, and in order to bring that to life, um, instead of making an ad about it, they did a social experiment. And what they did is they invited women to come in, um, didn't tell them what they were doing. They had them sit down with um, a, a, a forensic sketch artist who couldn't see them. And the women were asked to describe themselves. And the sketch artist did a sketch of them. They also had strangers who had interacted with that same woman, also didn't know what was going on, come and describe the same woman to the same forensic sketch artist who did an uh, additional drawing of the woman. They put those two images side by side and presented those back to the women. And w what was really striking and, and emotionally powerful is the, dis the drawing based on the woman's description of herself was far less attractive than the one um, done based on the stranger's description, which really tells us a lot about how we view ourselves. Um, I think it very much applies to women, but it applies to men, um, and what, what's rooted in our self-esteem and the way we, we think about ourselves relative to how the world does. This video was probably shot for you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, and it, uh, I think it has 16 million, one of the videos has over 16 million views on YouTube. Uh, another great, you know, great old established brand, Coke, um, has done a great job of kind of embracing uh, new tools. Um, Coke's brand is about happiness. Um, it's a sugar water. Their product is sugar water, but again, they don't tell stories, thankfully, about sugar water. They live into the idea that Coke is about happiness and about sharing happiness. And instead of talking about that in an ad, uh, because more and more these days we're tuning out and ignoring ads, they created uh, a similar experiment to Dove where they took um, connected, internet connected vending machines, placed um, one in, uh, uh, some in India and some in Pakistan, and they were connected to each other. And the only way to get a Coke out of this machine was to have a, a, a human interaction, a Pakistani and an Indian person having a, an interaction, playing a game, posing for a photo, having a chat. Um, and by doing that, they released a Coke. So they literally were creating moments of happiness between these two you know, you know, peoples that wouldn't, you know, don't typically get along these days. Um, and the outcome was um, releasing a, 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 a can of Coke or bottle. And then finally, a, another brand I think we're all familiar with and um, did something very powerful last year. Um, Red Bull's brand is about, uh, the, the tagline is, gives you wings. And Red Bull actually does very little advertising. What they do instead is sponsor events um, and activities that live into this idea of giving you wings. And one of the most striking examples of that is they sponsored the first ever skydive from space, and they streamed it live around the world, and it got a huge amount of attention and press, um, and uh, you know, ultimately much more successful in, in our minds than, a, than, than shooting or running a 60-second ad. So where does that leave us? Um, I found this quote, um, a guy who didn't really know much about digital but was very smart, Benjamin Franklin. Um, he said, words may show a man's wit, but actions his meaning. And I think that can tell us a lot about branding today. Uh, words may show a brand's wit, but actions its meaning. So in other words, the strongest brands in our minds going forward will, instead of talking about their stories or telling stories in a traditional way, they'll actually act them out and demonstrate and live into what they believe in and, um, and, and what they want their customers to understand about them. So now I'm going to talk about some principles uh, that have worked for us and show a few examples of work we've done that we feel kind of live into these. And these, things, these are things you can think about as you're thinking about how to tell or create your own stories about your companies or brands. 
The first one is be entertaining. More and more, as I said, we're tuning out messages we don't want and tuning in to messages we do want. And that's why something like Real Beauty sketches worked is because it, it was a powerful, emotional, um, resonant story that people wanted to, to, wanted to consume and more importantly, share with their friends. Um, this is the piece of work that I worked on for PNC Bank. Um, one of PNC's values is financial literacy um, and helping um, kids within the communities that they're part of understand finance as a sort of bedrock for future um, financial stability. Um, but most kids don't want to learn about finance. Um, so something we do, uh, we, we did this past year is created something called the Christmas Price Index, which um, essentially takes the 12 gifts from the 12 days of Christmas and determines their current prices. And what we did is we created toys, virtual toys based on each of these gifts, and we let kids build them in a virtual workshop as they learned about their prices and the economic, um, the, the economic uh, factors behind the rise or fall of those prices. And then we took it one step further and we actually took the designs created by these kids and had them printed on 3D printers and sent them to a select number of kids um, so that they'd arrive in time for the holidays. Um, and I'll play a quick video just to, to um, take you through how this, how this actually played out. Do you know that song, The 12 Days of Christmas? Every year, the Christmas Price Index figures out how much it would cost to buy each of the gifts. And schools all over the USA use it to teach kids about finance. But finance can be super boring. That's why PNC made Gift Maker. For the 12 days, you could build your own toys and find out if their prices went up or down this year. And you could get your toy in real life. Every day, PNC picked some of the toy designs, printed them on 3D printers, and mailed it to you in time for Christmas by turning a finance lesson into a fun game. A bank showed kids that learning about money doesn't have to be painful. So something you'll see is, in a, in a way, advertisers, smart advertisers, are now starting to behave more like startups and create tools and things that people want to interact with rather than pushing ads out at them. Another principle that is really important is make yourself useful. Um, utility, as we all know, is huge on the internet, and the brands that actually offer utility that reinforce what their product or brand is about um, tend to leap ahead of um, brands who don't. Um, so Lunesta is a client of ours, um, and they make the leading sleep medicine in the US. Um, and we can talk about the medicine, and actually legally we're li very limited in what we can say about the medicine, but what we can do is we can create tools that help people get better sleep. So we created something called Project Luna, which was a set of initiatives to help everyone get a better night's sleep through content, tools, and apps. And I'll play a quick case study of this. Insomnia has become a public health epidemic, yet sales of Lunesta were declining. We needed to do more than just talk about the pill. We needed to help people create healthier sleep habits. The solution was Project Luna. Education, tools, and support that anyone could use to get a better night's sleep. Visitors could explore the anatomy of sleep, take a sleep census, or pledge to improve their sleep routine. And we created the Luna Tracker, an app that let users set personal sleep goals, keep track of daily activities that affect sleep, and record their actual sleep patterns. Integrated advertising helped spread the word about the project. With Project Luna, a pharmaceutical company showed that encouraging healthy habits can help make the business healthier, too. Um, another thing that's constantly coming up in, in our business is we want, what do we do about social? We want to be in social channels. And uh, it's a really interesting and powerful, powerful opportunity, but it's also challenging. One of the things we talk to our clients about is sort of speaking or uh, talking like the locals. And what that essentially means is be very sensitive and aware of the channel that you're dealing with. And, and don't rush to be present in every, every channel. Think about which channels are most relevant to your business, where are your customers, and, and what kind of content or experiences can you offer in those channels that will really resonate with them. Because the worst thing that can happen, and we've seen a lot of brands do it in the US, is to jump into a social channel just to be there and make big mistakes and, and misread or you know, push their advertising out, um, push their advertising out at, or um, you know, have a customer service misstep. And that's where the audience kind of really rejects um, uh, your brand and you've actually um, harmed yourselves rather than build, um, helping to build. Um, so a great case of using a channel appropriately that, that we did, that we're very proud of last year, 
um, is for TNT in the launch of a new um, a mob show called Mob City. Um, and for the first time ever, we took the pilot script and we tweeted it out line by line through Twitter and surrounded it with uh, exclusive content, behind the scenes videos, um, photography, um, conversation from the, from the ac actors, actors and director within the show. And this got a, um, a, a huge amount of buzz um, as, uh, as people got psyched up to um, tune in for the show. And this is a quick case study. To stand out with the launch of TNT's newest show, Mob City, we made them the first television show to be adapted onto Twitter. For three days before the premiere, we tweeted every word of the pilot episode script, with GIFs and photos bringing characters and sets to life. It was a new way to tell a story, a new way to look at Twitter, and a new way to watch a show. Mob City Twitter script took the show from 2,000 Twitter feeds to 43 million Twitter feeds. And a, le a, a lesson with this is these things don't have to be very ex expensive. If, you're, if you can outsmart, not outspend your competitors by really being choiceful in the kinds of things you, you support and, and the way that you use these um, channels. Um, and then just a final one is just as important as what you say and how you say it to your consumer and what you do to demonstrate your brand. It's really important to listen and incorporate the ideas um, and, and values and, um, of your audiences into the work you do. Um, and so uh, when PNC Bank told us they wanted to go onto Facebook um, at the sort of at the peak of the financial crisis, we said, you know, you really have to be careful um, about that. And we. Um, we decided to um, use it as a channel in a very focused way to support community initiatives that people cared about. So it was a little bit modeled after Kickstarter, a social funding platform modeled after Kickstarter, and they used it as a way of funding local projects in their communities with micro grants of um, $500 or less, and in exchange um, had those, um, uh, those, uh, their audiences or the, the, their consumers um, fan them on Facebook or, or like them on Facebook so that they could open that up as a, as a um, uh, communication channel um, to that audience and were able to um, get a, a hundred, over 100,000 new followers through this program. What would you do to make your neighborhood stronger? Throw a dance party at the retirement home? Buy a ping pong table for the local rec center? Or create a community garden devoted entirely to tomatoes? Whatever it is, PNC's neighborhood wish list could help make it happen. Here's how it works. Submit a project with a budget of up to $500. If your project gets selected, we'll post it to the wish list. Then you share it and get all your friends and family to vote for it. Each vote brings you closer to making it happen. When you reach your goal, we'll give you the money to turn your idea into a reality. Even if you don't have a project, you can vote and share to help other people's projects happen. Submit, share, vote. PNC's Neighborhood wish list for making good things happen in your neighborhood. So to sort of sum up, um when you act out your brand story, it's very important to be entertaining, to make yourself useful, to talk like the locals, and not forget to listen. And it sort of struck me when I was putting this presentation together, these aren't technology traits um, or th things that are uniquely digital. All of these things are about being human. And it's, uh, it's, it's sort of ironic but great that as, as more and more digital tools and channels come about, it's giving the ability to brands to act in a much more human way, to act not like technology, but to act like people. And finally, uh, one thing not to forget is that your brand story is never completely told, and, and that's a sort of a burden, but also an opportunity, that you don't get one shot at this. You can constantly iterate and change and evolve your story um, and incorporate the, the, the stories and feedback from your audiences. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>